Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, a retired FBI profiler and former New York City prosecutor and currently writer and producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. Today with me in the studio is... Laura Richards. I'm co-founder and director of Paladin, the National Stalking Advocacy Service, and also author of the Dash Risk Assessment Model and the book Policing Domestic Violence. Well, it's great to have you back with me in the studio, and we are here today for an extra special extra episode about viewer questions. And in fact, we're going to start with some very serious questions that people have posed to us because they need help. And it's I have to say it's an honor, Laura, to be working with you on this because we're actually not just telling stories. We're actually affecting people's lives. We're educating people and giving people opportunities to reach out for help. So thank you so much for that. Well, that's the importance of this podcast. It's not just us talking in a studio. Like you say, Jim, see, it's the reach that we have of being able to talk to people. It's quite an intimate experience listening to a podcast, but to be able to talk about the warning signs and the risk factors. And of course, quite a few people are now emailing us or contacting us via Twitter or Facebook, really saying they're in a desperate situation or they're concerned for somebody else. So it's uh, really good to be able to give some informed information so that people can make the right decisions to stay safe. That's right. And we want you to keep coming to us with your questions and with your concerns about yourselves or other people. Uh, We'll do the best we can to help out. So the first one is about a coworker being stalked by the ex-wife of a boyfriend. We're not going to use the names of the people that wrote in, but thank you for writing in, L. Um, L writes that a single coworker of mine and a single mother seems like a relatively low risk person, but by putting herself out there and going on dates, I'm afraid she's crossed paths with somebody who might be very high risk and may make her a potential victim. This guy's ex-wife has harassed the co-worker many, many times at home, at work, in public, and on public social media forums. They go on to state, I believe this ex-wife does have a history of domestic violence and had the police called on her many times. What can my co-worker do? There was a lot of focus on men being the domestic abusers, but I'm wondering if women abusers are handled or treated differently. Any insight would be helpful. Thanks. Well, firstly, you know, thank you for taking the time to write in on behalf of your friend and your work colleague. And, you know, it's sorry to hear that they've been going through this, but certainly threats being made has been mentioned. We have to take extremely seriously, particularly when we know when stalking is persistent, that one in two where there's been an intimate relationship will act on that threat, and then one in ten where there hasn't been an intimate relationship between the person stalking and the victim, that they can also act on the threat. So the first thing really to do is uh, I would advise you to have a look on the Paladin website, www.paladinservice.co.uk, because there's some very clear safety tips on there. And there's also the 11 risk questions that um, either that your co-worker or you can answer on their behalf. And certainly when you have a female stalker and it, stalking another female, yes, these cases can be risky and they can be dangerous. It's not necessarily just about the the gender. We've certainly dealt, and I have dealt with some very dangerous and high-risk female perpetrators. Mm-hmm. So, you know, certainly they shouldn't be taken any less seriously, but we see them in smaller numbers. And, of course, if your co-worker isn't necessarily as concerned about it or saying that she's fearful because threats have been made before then, you know, that could be a problem or a challenge in the way that it's being communicated to law enforcement, for example. So I would certainly complete these 11 questions with her or ask her to do them herself and and have a look at some of the leaflets that we have on there that you can click open and it gives some top 10 safety um, tips. And, you know, depending on where she comes out in terms of how persistent this behaviour is, if somebody's turning up at the workplace or turning up at their home address, then we know that there's much higher likely chance of an attack or an assault of some description. So we'd rather be hearing from people far earlier on rather than later on when it actually turns to physical violence. But I'm sure it's very distressing in terms of the psychological aspect, even though you mentioned that your co-worker is no longer dating this man purely because the stalking has just become too much for her. 
So I hope there's some useful things in there. But certainly, you know, she's lucky to have a, a co-worker like you and a, and a friend. And if she won't understand it as, as being something that's serious and that she just has to put up with it, a good thing to do again is to ask her to listen to the podcast and then she can hear some of the episodes where we talk about abuse and how these things can escalate to, to violence. Of course, that doesn't happen in every case, but to have a look at uh, the website in the first instance, even to call Paladin, we're still, it, it doesn't say whether you're in the United States or whether you're um, in the UK, but it's a UK-based resource. And I'm sure even if you are from the US, if you had questions that you wanted to ask one of the the advocates in more detail, then that would happen as well. The service doesn't turn people away. We want to make sure people get the right advice. That's great, yeah. Well, I hope that you do reach out, and if there is anything more that you need to ask us, we'll be happy to follow up with in a further episode, or directly if you message us on our Facebook page or leave a message on Wondery or some other forum. We will get back to you as soon as we can. So the next letter is from someone I'll say N, and N had read Laura's article about Lily Allen and posed a question. She said she was on a plane and she found herself sitting beside a man about the same age. She was nervous flying her first international flight, so she struck up a conversation with him, chatted on and off throughout the flight, learned that he was in Canada on a visa and it had just expired. He was returning to England. They had the flight and had some discussion about the fact that the writer had a boyfriend and was going to meet him, and this guy made sure that she knew the proper train to get on at Victoria Station. So he was being helpful. Because of this, she emailed him to thank him and said that she had met her boyfriend without incident and that everything was great. He emailed back, and they exchanged two or three emails shortly after, but since she was, wasn't interested in starting any kind of new friendship with this guy, she stopped replying. But he would email every so often and continued to email, but she never responded. She even changed her email account, but had the old email forwarded, and he kept writing emails over and over again. Over basically a few years, he sent Facebook and LinkedIn requests, and they were all ignored. She even closed her LinkedIn account for over a year, and her Facebook account is private, but she recently opened a new LinkedIn account and instantly re received a request from him. She ignored it. He sent an email. She ignored that. Then another. He sent another LinkedIn request. All these were ignored, but she didn't block him. She said, I was careful not to look at his profile because I didn't want to make him feel rejected, but more that maybe I didn't check my account often. So she was trying to make it seem like innocuous rather than in his face rejection. Then she found out from her employer that this man emailed the company's main information email asking if she worked there and explained that he had met her a few years back on a plane. Her boss was concerned because the email seemed like this man was delusional. He had advised me not to contact the man at all, block him on all social media. She did that and sent LinkedIn message explaining what had happened and that this man had used their site inappropriately. In other words, she notified LinkedIn that this guy was basically stalking her online. She asked that they remove him. She re received an email from the man later that he saw that she had viewed his profile. He was writing like he had no idea of how appropriate, inappropriate his actions were and then advised me he was coming to Canada and wanted to see me. He knows where I work and clearly has no boundaries. I called the police in my city, asked for their advice. They told me they couldn't do anything because he wasn't in Canada. She had a lawyer draft a cease and desist letter. Uh, he sent it to the man, and the man apologized, but the lawyer said that it seemed like this guy still didn't know that his actions were wrong. And she would like to know if there's any reach for the National Stalking and Advocacy Service that would go into... Canada and whether or not they could work internationally with police in other countries. She said, this may seem minor, but I am afraid. I think that's a very important statement, and I'll let you respond to it, but I just want to say that she feels like she needs some advice. She's scared. 
she's alone sometimes and she doesn't know when this guy is coming to Canada. So anything you could do to advise her, Laura? Well, as you say, Jim, that's exactly right. The fact that she's so fearful and, you know, this has gone on for a number of years and the fear is a big indicator um, here. So we would never see this as something less serious. Um, it certainly shows persistence and it shows that he's got an inappropriate understanding of what's going on and his uh, sense of a perceived relationship that doesn't exist. And it sounds like she's done everything right. That's the important thing to say mm -hmm. um, in terms of trying to ensure that the contact doesn't happen. And I mean, she doesn't say whether there's still persistent contact since the cease and desist letter. But the very fact that she's still feeling fearful, um, you know, should be taken seriously and the fact that she's living alone. So, I mean, I would certainly say again to have a look at the Paladin website and you can click on um, an advice leaflet for victims and it will give the 11 screening questions of risk. And the very first question is, are you very frightened? So mm. it's, we're after understanding about extreme fear. You know, is it something that's stopping you from sleeping, from, you know, something that's on your mind that's actually changing your behaviour day to day? Whether there's been um, what the previous history is, because we know that people normally suffer 100 times before they report to the police what sort of behaviour there is. So, you know, are they following? Are they turning up? In this case, a lot of it is social media. But we know that he's tracking her because he's finding out, you know, where she's working, etc. And, of course, he's saying that he's going to go to Canada. So I would absolutely recommend that you have a look at the 11 questions. There are some things that she won't know um, in terms of his history because she right. met him on a plane. And, you know, sometimes with cases, we don't know the full history of who it is that's stalking. Um, the victim but certainly there's a lot of safety tips as well on the website we have the top 10 sort of safety tips around the physical things your day-to-day -day. so tightening up your security at home changing your daily routine just checking do, checking your digital footprint google yourself you know I'd say that to everybody who listens to our podcast put your name into google and just see what comes up because you'll probably be very surprised about what's up there yeah I know I've been very shocked in the past when people have said they googled me and found certain information and went online and and can go very deeply and find a lot of information about a person just because they're out in the real world and people will post things about you. And that's exactly it. It's tweets, not just what you post, right. it's what other people post for you. Right. And tweets that, that you have can be Googled and found and all sorts of different things, pictures. There you are pictures. might give a presentation. You know, Jim gave a presentation the other day to LAPD and if someone gets hold of those slides, they may then post them online and it might have your mobile or your cell number. Correct. So, you know, you might be on the voters register and they sell the data on. So, and just bear in mind, whatever you see is only... 0.03% of what's actually out there about you. So if you keep going back, keep going back, you know, there would be lots of information there. So absolutely to regularly check your digital footprint. I always say that to all professionals. Um, I've mentioned it to Jim recently as well. And, you know, certainly if you are fearful that somebody is pursuing you and they're fixated, have a look at what's out there. Try and tighten up the things that are on your, you know, your privacy settings, etc., on social right. media. And there are actually companies that you can pay to c sort of scrub the internet for you. Try to get information that's out there off. It's very difficult. It may not be complete, but it may help at least to a certain degree. But Laura, one of the things that um, that really struck me in this person's letter is that repeatedly. She says that he just doesn't understand the wrongfulness of his actions. And to me, that's, that's a big risk factor. Mm. If he doesn't even understand that what he's doing is wrong, the chances are he's not going to modify his behavior. He's going to continue doing this until somebody stops him. Now, it may be that this letter from the lawyer, cease and desist letter, will have some effect. But... Apparently, the lawyer in the conversation determined that this guy still didn't understand the wrongfulness. So I think this guy may have some mental issues, right? Well, certainly boundaries are a problem here. So, you know, we don't know what to what degree, but mm -hmm. he clearly uh, sounded pretty lucid, I would have thought, during her conversation whilst she's on the aeroplane with him um, to the point that they, you know, exchange emails, etc., so it's very hard to determine at this stage, uh, you know, what's really going on other than the fact that he doesn't understand boundaries. He's not respecting what she's saying. 
it might be he doesn't have the capacity to understand it, as you said, Jim, or it might just be he's somebody who pushes the boundaries. Yeah. Um, you know, we see that with, with lots of cases. But if he obviously does g turn up in Canada, uh, that tells us that he's following through on the things that he's saying. Um, and I would certainly, you know, we never say you must go to the police, but I would certainly consider speaking to an advocate. Obviously, there's only so much I can do with the knowledge that I've understood from what's been written in. But our assessments normally take at least two to three hours to do a full assessment with a client to really understand risk, to understand need and put a full safety plan in place. So it might be that she wants to actually contact Paladin. And the question regarding, you know, whether Paladin's reach is across the world global well, not yet is the short answer, mm. but we know, you know, that so many people do suffer and endure stalking and many put up with it for a long time and they wait for a tipping point before they do something. And we'd much rather hear from people like this particular uh, Lady N before there's a tipping point. So, again, you know, it might be something that you feel you actually do want to report to the police and we, we wouldn't say you must or you should because that's not what we, what we say in these cases it's right. it depends on risk and it depends on need but i would certainly look at paladin's website and we are trying to set up something here in the us um, and ensure certainly here 7.5 million people are stalked every year and in canada there's a high and significant number too and there's no dedicated service yeah so we're hoping that we can help to bring that kind of service here to the us because clearly there's a huge need for it and there's a vacuum right now, so hopefully we'll be able to do that. And we're going to be able to do that more if, with the help of the people out there who are listening, because the more noise you make with your local politicians and uh, your social service agencies, the more they'll realize there is a need. And, and there's a real gap. And, you know, the emails that we're getting absolutely show that. And certainly, you know, it's just not good enough to say to people, oh, we'll just ignore it and in the hope that it will go away. Because unfortunately, when there's fixation and obsession, it doesn't go away. And, you know, going back to the boundary question, we don't know how far somebody is on a, a spectrum or even on a continuum. And those people who are fixated and obsessed, well, they need help too. So there's two parts to this. You know, the, the victims that are... Uh, normally multiple victims when we're talking about perpetrators because they are serial and then the perpetrators themselves who clearly have psychosocial problems at the very least and there's psychological you know and psychosocial damage to them when they pursue targets like this right and I mean targets I'm talking about people victims because when people get stuck it shows that they do need some form of help yes Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands, or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I haven't had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. Okay, and the next message is from E. And E says, sitting here at work, listening to your podcast for two days now. Thank you. I'm in an abusive relationship. You have no idea how much courage you have given me. He is not physically abusive yet, but he has threatened it towards me and has been physically abusive to our pets. He is controlling and emotionally abusive. I called a lawyer two weeks ago to see how I could get him out of my house, but I lost the nerve to follow through with it. I will be making the return call. Thanks for a very logical and straightforward look at domestic abuse. I needed it. Well, there's a few things here, obviously, that we should address, but what's your first thoughts on this, Laura? Well, you know, I'm really pleased that he decided to email us and you know we know there are thousands and thousands of people in this situation 
So whenever I hear people say, oh, these victims over here, as if they're in a box, you know, in a particular place, yeah. rather than us, we, the people that we interact with, and of course the people who listen to the podcast, you know, I'm so pleased that you have understood your situation in, in a different way and that you're also thinking about leaving safely because that's a really important part to this too, um, to understand and assimilate information and to do things in a safe way, to talk to an advocate. You know, I would say somebody who is a trained advocate in domestic violence because not all lawyers are. Um, so calling the domestic violence helpline anonymously if you're in the US or if not, if you're in the UK. And there are people out there who will talk you through and help you make informed choices and informed decisions because you can leave safely and there is life after abuse. Um, certainly the word courage, it comes from cur, which is the French word for heart. And, you know, I felt a heart, felt connection, just getting this email through, knowing that making a difference to people's lives is something, you know, for me, it's absolutely at the centre of what we do. And the fact that you're saying that he's not physically abusive yet, but he's threatened it. Says that, you know, things can well escalate. And certainly, you know, on separation, we do see escalation. So I'd really encourage you to talk to a trained expert before picking up the phone to the lawyer again to think about a proper safety plan so that, and an exit strategy so that you can leave safely. Right. And when you say he's abusive to our pets, that is abusive. That is physical violence. And that is something that is an indicator that he's willing to do that to humans. When you're willing to hurt someone or something that is helpless, that cannot defend itself, that shows sort of a sadistic bent. And that is something that I would say is a risk factor for being violent to humans. Absolutely. So, it's one of the high risk factors in the DASH, in the DASH risk assessment model. Yeah, so I think that that is something I think you're very smart to have pointed that out because it does indicate that he might try to hurt you. And the fact that he threatened you and that, it's hurt, that he's hurting the pet means that he is a danger to you. And I know in the subtext of this, it's obvious that you said, I lost the nerve to follow through with it. There's probably some connections there between you two. You got together for a reason. There was a reason why you have a relationship. There's a reason why you were living together. And those are things that are difficult to break off. And very commonly, people will, despite the fact that they are in, a, in an abusive or dangerous situation, they will stay because of the other things. And it's sort of a, an ambivalence, a strong feeling both for and against a person that creates this problem. The fact is that it's not going to get better if you just let him continue to do this. Now, it's possible that with some serious motivated therapy on his part that he might learn to avoid that kind of abusive, psychological abusiveness and physical abusiveness, but it's certainly not going to happen if this isn't addressed in a, in a very direct way. The problem is that if you try to address it with him that way, he may respond violently. If you tell him that you're leaving, he may respond violently. And that's something, as Laura said, you need to have good advice and an ex exit strategy that's safe before you do anything like that. Absolutely. And, you know, to be able to get your house back, it, it sounds like that he has moved in. I don't know whether it was a whirlwind relationship, but certainly there's a number of high risk factors that have been described. So do also have a look at the Dash Risk Checklist website. Um, it's also on Twitter as well, at Dash Checklist. And you can, you know, just answer some of the questions that are on there. You can self-administer so that you have an understanding of risk level. Um, you know, I'm certainly concerned about the coercive control levels and animals tend to be used to try and control um, normally the, the, the adult partner, but also if there are children involved. So, you know, coercive control is very concerning and it's a very strong and uh, clear link with serious violence and homicide. So just because somebody hasn't been violent yet, please don't see that as not being as serious. So... Happy to talk to you some more, or you can reach out to Paladin or any of the domestic violence helplines or hotlines. So thank you. We really appreciate your email. And, you know, please do keep us updated if we can help in any, any other way. 
Yes, and, and good luck. Thanks for writing. So the next one, um, we, we've had lots of emails from victims, but these are the, the significant ones where we felt that we wanted to comment uh, in a quicker way. So we will always come back to people's emails, um, but we have been inundated. And certainly this one is from somebody called E, who I just want to say it was a wonderful email to receive. And she just basically wanted to let us know that she had been in a five-year abusive relationship and that she acknowledges from listening to our podcast of what happened to Nicole and says how awful the 911 call was to listen to, that even though she's five years in a new relationship with a daughter and free of abuse, that she still has nightmares about what happened to her. And she basically says that she's only healing now. But the point is that she is healing now and, you know, she's stronger and she's in a loving relationship and she wanted to make it clear that there is life after abuse. But she was the person like Nicole, keeping a secret diary, keeping the photos, um, photos of broken windows and also of bruises and that it breaks her heart to hear what happened to Nicole because she sees that they were on the same pathway. Mm. Only she survived and escaped and obviously Nicole didn't. So she says, you know, we need advocacy services like Paladin uh, we need people like us fighting the good fight at the front line and helping people and also need people to donate, donate to services like Paladin. So, And she also says she wants to help locally. So what can she do to help locally is her last question to us. Well, that's great. And, and I think one of the best things about this letter is that it provides hope. And I think hope is an incredibly great thing because if people are in a situation where they're being abused, where they feel like they don't have any way out, where or they have get a voice, a voice at all. Yeah. But, but they get tunnel vision about being stuck in this situation. And the problem is that that doesn't give them any desire even to leave. Uh, they just think this is what their life lot is and they're and stuck with it. Self-esteem and confidence, everything's eroded and people do become entrapped. Right. But when you know, when you hear a story like this, you know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a way to get away and have a good life if you do it properly, if you do it with the right of right advice and with an exit strategy that's safe, then that is something that can lead you to a better life. And we hope that anybody that's in an abusive relationship can find their way out of it. Obviously, organizations like Paladin can help you, but also... We need to have people help their friends, help their family members, get people to see that. Yeah, keep that, an open dialogue with people, be able to have the conversation. Right. Because sometimes when you talk to people about it, when you see it in your friends or your family members, um, they don't recognize it in themselves and they don't really want to get help. They're, they're too entrenched in the relationship. But what you might want to do, though, is recommend to those people, if you recognize it in family or friends, that they have a problem. They're in a situation where they're being taken advantage of or abused. Recommend to them some of the episodes where we've talked about this. And you never know. They might recognize themselves in the stories that we're telling. And they may actually then be motivated to try to get some help. So you might be able to indirectly get them help just by telling them to listen to us talking about this. We hope that that is a positive effect of, of having these conversations. Well, it's a ripple effect, I think, and that's important. And certainly, you know, I would say that whoever a victim discloses to is the lifeline. So be the lifeline for the next person and educate people. When you're sat around the dinner table and someone says something ignorant about abuse and violence, educate them. Don't be a bystander. So those things are really important for all of us to do, to stand up and, and be counted and share experiences because guaranteed there will be someone sat there, one in three females suffer from domestic violence, one in six men. So there will be someone sat there, as we know how prevalent this is, and the same right. with stalking. Yeah, and it's it, that has borne itself out in, in reality here with us because as Laura and I go out and talk to people when, when we're at conferences or when we're at dinner parties with friends, just when we raise this topic, it's amazing how many people say, oh man, I, I was stalked or yeah, I was in an abusive relationship. And, and if you heard in earlier episodes, Lisa disclosed to Laura and I during the recording of one of our podcasts that she had been in an abusive relationship. So I think it is incredibly common, but very rarely 
spoken about it's openly. It's still taboo, sadly. It's still taboo. So we still need to keep breaking the myths and these uh, the silences. And that's what we're all about, making the links, breaking the chains and breaking the silence. Well, we hope that the answers that Laura has given you here will direct you in the right way to get the right help and the right advice so that you can actually improve your lot in life because as the last writer has proven, there is life after domestic violence. There is life after stalking. There is life after any bad experience. If you survive it physically, you can survive it mentally. You can go on with your life. You can do great things. You can have a wonderful experience. I think I'm a living example of that. I think Laura is a living example of that. We have both been through things in our lives and we've both still move forward. We've used Come it as a motivation. Yeah. That's we, the important thing. We've used it as a motivational force to help other people who go through tough times. And we're very happy to be able to help people, to be in a position to help people and get the word out. Well, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is, we're going to be signing out on this episode of Real Crime Profile. And please continue to share it with your friends, tell people about it, talk about it at work, at home, and at parties. But also, there's a very short survey at Wondery.com, a listener survey. And since we're a new podcast, we'd like to find out uh, about our listener base. It takes a few clicks to go through it in a couple minutes, and that's about it. So thank you very much for listening. Take care. We'll see you again on Real Crime Profile. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan, engineered by Jacob Moose Molin. Music is composed and performed by Simba Sumba. Logo art by Rob Cohen. Real Crime Profile is produced and recorded at Empire Studios LA by XG Productions. <laughs>